This is for you out there, every one of you, pilots and crew members alike. Soon you're going to be flying across the whole face of this globe, over every possible type of terrain, over Arctic, jungle, and desert. So get this straight. Any land you fly over, you may someday have to walk over. And in most cases, the walking isn't too good. Take the desert, for instance. That means a lot of spots besides Africa. There's China and the Gobi Desert, Australia and the Great Sandy, plus the desert lands of Arabia, Iran, and Western India. All of them are rough. All of them are dry, hot, and without mercy for the men who don't know them. This is the kind of country where you fry during the day and where you can shiver with cold at night, and where a man would sell his soul for a drink of water. During the North African campaign, a lot of our men found out about this the hard way, which is the only way the desert teaches anything. That's why you'll have to know it. A fight against the desert is a fight to the finish. The Pippin and her crew can testify to that. For here's where they crash landed. One day in late summer, far off their course after blasting an Aegean target out of the war, and after paying the enemy for the pleasure of doing it. Yes, they got it right where it hurts the most. Anti-aircraft knocked out one of the engines. Messerschmitts did the rest. The B-24 was riddled from nose to tail. The navigator and radio gunner, both wounded during the fight. Even getting this far was a rugged deal. For the first time, these boys found out just how big, how empty a desert can be. Down here in the middle of nothing, it looked a lot different than it did from 10,000 feet. Yeah, a lot different. Within an hour after they'd crawled out of their ship and got busy, they had a pretty fair idea of the spot they were in. No matter how they tried to ignore it. No matter how they tried to laugh it off. Say, anybody feel warm? Warm? Are you kidding? It's not the heat. It's the humidity. Turn me over when I'm brown on one side, will you, Joe? Quit thinking about it. It'll make you thirstier. A lot of good that'll do. Five gallons of water shot to hell. Look, ham stitching. That Mr. Schmidt pilot must have been a tailor back in Berlin. Hey, when you get your radio fixed up, George, have them drop us a case of cold Coke right away, will you? That's a hell of a joke. If we had a portable transmitter with us, we wouldn't have to wait for that mess in the ship to start working. We'd be out of here by tonight. Well, you knew the one we had in the ship was being repaired. You were there yesterday when Shorty took it over to the radio shop. Why didn't you bring a good one along? Nobody stopped you. Yeah, and in the 15 minutes they gave it to take off, I should have brought a thermos of coffee and fruit juices and checked every emergency kit, too, huh? Well, why didn't you or Joe or anybody? Quiet, you guys. Things are tough enough as it is. Besides, who ever thought we'd end up this way? Or what are we laying around for? Why don't we get out of here? That ship isn't going to fly us out. we got to walk right now. Cut it out, Phil. No, I mean it, Skipper. Why are we wasting time with all this? What chance did the lieutenant and Shorty got without a doctor? We gotta bring one back. We don't even have enough water to lay around here and wait. We're off course Listen, and... a man walking out there on the desert has about as much chance of being spotted from the air as he has of finding Hetty Lamar out there behind some sand dune. We're gonna stick right here with the ship, as long as we can. Crossing that desert and coming out on top is just about a thousand to one shot. We're gonna stay right here for at least three days and hope that somebody spots us. After that, then... Well, maybe a couple of us will take a shot at going after help. But that's our last and longest chance of them all. All right, men, sit down someplace. I guess it's just about time we got a few other things straightened out, too. Now, we're way off any main course, and nobody back at the base knows just what happened or where we are, but still... Don't smoke, Bob. It'll just make you thirstier. But still, we're lucky to be out of enemy territory, or we'd have to burn the ship. Well, in case anything does happen, I can bury your burn this stuff in a minute. Good deal, Larry. Now, listen. I don't want anybody going out into the sun. If you do, you're a cinch for heat stroke or heat exhaustion. Out here with the water we've got, that means you're finished. So we'll work only at night or early in the morning. Things may be a little rugged, I know, but... We'll manage it all right if we keep our heads and go easy on the water supply. And if George here can figure out a way to repair the radio... I'll try, sir. We'll take a fix with the sextant and see just where we are. Uh, be sure you keep the navigator's clock wound up, George. Okay. Now, first of all, the water's going to be rationed. 
That was the big worry, water. And without it, nothing else mattered. Their supply came to just 27 gallons. Sounds a lot, doesn't it, 27 gallons of water? But listen, that was to be split equally with all the crew, except the two wounded men who would need more than the others in order to live. For these others, one quart per man per day to last them exactly 10 days. And for the first 12 hours, nobody outside of the two casualties would get one single drop to drink. Tough, plenty, but adequate and bearable and wise. Oh, let's get organized. Gil, do you have any ideas? Yeah. You see that section right over there, beyond that dune? Mm -hmm. Well, I think that ought to make a pretty good landing strip. It looks solid. There aren't too many big rocks there, and it should be easy to clear. Then if a plane should show up, it could land. We could even rig up a landing tee with one of the parachutes. Soak some rags in oil and make strip players out of them. Well, let's go, guys. Let's get started. Sit down, George. You don't rush things in the desert, and you don't work until it gets dark. Keep your shirt on, too, unless you want to boil. Yes. Remember, heat stroke. Now, we've got to get some ground signals out if we don't want to get caught with our pants down. Now, that looks pretty flat up there, and it's fairly high. I think it'd be a good idea if we made some oil and sand fires up there for distress signals. And if we find some bushes, we can burn them, too. We can find the signal we need right here in the emergency manual. Um, by the way, Joe, did you get the signal flares out of the ship? Yes, sir, right here. And signal panels, too. Good you enough. know, we could scrape the camouflage off the top of this wing. And, and we, we can spread out a ship and the same protection on the The reading they took that first night showed them to be 400 miles from their base, 60 miles from the nearest marked water hole. Shelter? Well, this B-24 with its high wing gave them one good break, a natural roof. No, that fire isn't for warmth, it's for cooking. And you can make a stove out of any old can. Just use some sand drenched with oil and a little gasoline to get it started. And speaking of dinner, remember the desert heat hastens the spoilage of food, so don't let it stand in open containers. Their tent, made for the cool nights, if 102 degrees can be called cool, was built out of tubing and parachute cloth. As a matter of fact, you'll find parachutes are invaluable for countless things, for screens, for shades, for sleeping bags. But signaling an airplane was their one big hope. And George got busy on landing strip markers. Filled with well-oiled sand, dropped in a cloth wick, light, and you're in. After scraping paint off the wing for a while, Phil decided that an easier way to get a reflecting surface was just to use cowling or any piece from the interior of the ship that already had a shiny surface. Joe's detail was signal fires, and that's where the oil cans came in again. In daytime, when a trail of smoke is worth a dozen fires, he'll add rubber to the oil sand mixture. But now, a flame's the thing. No rubber, less oil, more gas. There'll be nine of those fires set in one large cross, the sign that medical help is needed. But help, when it comes, needs a place to land. So Gil and Bob are clearing a strip for an emergency runway. Since the landing lights hadn't been broken when they came down, Sam and Larry took them out of the wings and spliced enough wire together to hook them up to the batteries. Well, the lights ought to send their beams up pretty high. Yeah. we will have to run up the engines, though, if we use that much of the juice in the batteries. Hey, did you count those very pistol cartridges? Yeah. Now, the way I figure, we can send one up every two hours. That'll be four a night, and we'll have enough for 12 days. Okay? I don't know. Maybe we'd better make it three a night. That'll leave us a reserve. Roger. Well, let's say we light up the work, see what it looks like. Okay with me. I'm all for getting picked up right now. They worked pretty well that first night. Thirsty? Sure. But they were still full of energy, and the lack of water hadn't begun to cut into that energy. But there was nothing out on the desert, or up above, to spot their signals that night. Nothing. Phil. What are you doing? I'm taking my share of the water and getting out of here. Why, you're screw. You'd be lost in an hour. Give me that. You haven't a chance out there on your own, kid. Nothing's got to pick us up. Listen here. To Somebody's got to go. Listen to me, Phil. You don't know what you're doing. We've got to stick together. Suppose you don't come back. Then we've got to go looking for you. That'll take more water. 
Now, if you don't care about yourself, think of the rest of us. I don't want anybody to go looking for me. If I make it, it's okay. We're all okay. If I don't, it's my business. Why, you stupid little jerk, I'll... Okay, sucker. Get into your straitjacket and take Sure, I'm crazy. You guys are saying... Only remember, what you're doing is desertion. Okay, Joe, I'll stick it out. But I'm telling you, we're never gonna get out of here. The start of the second day, with the temperature topping 100 degrees before 9 o'clock in the morning. Hot, burning days, nights that bring little relief, that's the summer desert for you. In the winter, you've got the rain and nights that are really cold. In winter or summer, there may be sandstorms. Any way you look at it, it's never any good. You are shorty. Yeah, take it slow now. Easy does it. Hey, feel better? As soon as you get a little stronger, you'll have to give George some tips on how to fix the radio. He can't get a peep of it. Let's start fanning him, Joe. Yes. His eyes look pretty inflamed. When he wakes up again, I'll use some more of this boric acid ointment on his eyes. Yes. Here. Good work, man. That ought to make it a lot better. Hey, Bob. You better use some of this sunburn gel. You're burned already. You too, Larry. I think I'll doctor up the water with some of this halazone. Smelled a little funny to me this morning. Maybe the can was dirty. My ration had a greasy taste to it. I hope it wasn't polluted. Sam was playing it safe, all right, but there's no sense in taking a chance. First, the halazone tablets must be crushed, two for every quart. Usually, it takes anywhere from 20 to 30 minutes for the tablets to work. You can tell when the water's ready because then you can smell the chlorine, sometimes taste it. But the water that really needs your attention is the water around native wells and villages. Always assume that's polluted. How's the water coming, Skipper? I'm dying for a drink. About 20 minutes. And remember, when you do get it, don't slop it down all at once. Wet your lips first, and then rinse it around your mouth. That's what the Arabs do. Drink it slowly and in small sips. Now, from tomorrow on, we get a pint in the morning and a pint at night. Skipper, Jim's coming, too. Get him a tube, Joe. We'll give him a drink. All right, Jim. How are you feeling, boy? The third day, with no luck. No let up in heat, no improvement in the wounded. But there was one improvement that third day in living quarters. A double fly awning for the crew's front porch. That air space between those layers of cloth lowered the temperature quite a bit. They've done the same thing at the rear, too, over that flap that's raised now to gain air circulation and to lose just a little more heat. Those are tricks that are priceless. Try to remember them, won't you? I'd only picked up that thermos on my way out of the mess hall. It was right there, right beside the door, full of coffee. Mess sergeant himself. Put on your goggles. The glare's got you seeing and thinking double. Okay, okay. Give me another car. at all from their signals all through the third night on the desert that's how it went no results from the radio no fall of dew they could gather and that's something else to remember this business about dew because you want to build up your water supply right from the very start a hole lined with canvas and a bed of rocks to catch the moisture it'll work if there's any to catch 
That was just it. There wasn't a drop. And pieces of metal left out overnight. That's a good idea, too. But not today. Not even on the wing of the plane. Those tricks will work if you're lucky. These boys weren't. They picked the driest season of the year in which to settle down on the desert. The fourth day out, with the men growing weaker, the water sinking lower in the containers, and no sign of help of any kind. Sam knew then they'd reached the point where something had to be done. Seems to be the only thing we can do, Sam. Yep. Well, I guess this is the day, men. Nothing's shown up, and we gotta do something about it. Look. Now, we're here. The base is over here. And the nearest oasis is here, 60 miles southeast of us. That's about six days' walking distance for men in our condition. Now, the way I figure it, two of us should make a stab at walking to that oasis. And if one should weaken, the other one might get through. But they'll each need three gallons of water for the hike. I don't think a quarter day is nearly enough for that much strain. And if they drink one gallon of it slowly, in the 12 hours before they leave, there won't be so much to carry. Well, six gallons from what we have now would leave enough for about eight days, wouldn't it, Gil? If we stay on the same rations. I told you we should have pulled out of here. Now we don't even have the strength to walk. We had to stay here at first. If anything had flown over us, they would have spotted the airplane. But the brakes were against us, that's all. Nothing did. Now, I think I ought to make the try, men. I know the desert a little better. And Gil can take over from me here. And you can keep the signals going while I'm gone. That'll give us a chance both ways. Now, what do you think? I think it's the only thing to do. Who are you going to take with you, Skipper? Well... How about you, Bob? You seem to be holding up all right. I'm for it, Skipper. Good. But now understand this one thing very clearly. Gil is going to be the boss around here. And whatever he says about rations or anything else goes. Is that understood? Jack? Yes, sir. Fine. Well, I'm going to start tonight. You have to travel light in the desert or you just don't travel far. Water, you'll take a maximum load of that. And that means a minimum of everything else. Sam took only the essentials. Goggles, compass, flashlight, knife, matches, bandages, eye salve, iodine, sunburn lotion. And then came the food items from the K rations. Biscuits, fruit and chocolate bars, dextrose tablets. Joe built a pack for Sam out of a regular parachute pack. He stripped it, cut off the excess harness, and made a pack that was practically ready-made. Light, compact, simple. It proves the point, all right. A little ingenuity can turn a dozen ordinary parts of a plane's equipment into a whole kit of life-saving tools. Can make the difference between give up and keep going. The emergency drinking water containers were filled for the trek. A small airspace had been left in them so they'd float in case they cracked at sea. At sea? Fill them up, Gil. Those boys won't be doing much floating. Meanwhile, Larry used the very pistol kit as a base for a pack for Bob. It's lighter than the parachute pack, but not as comfortable for a long trek. And parachute cloth will not only serve as a cover for the pack, it'll make an acceptable tent for them on their trip. George made some dust masks and spiral puttees. 
That's right, from a parachute. The puttees are a must for walking in deep, soft sand. And he traded shoes with Bob because nothing short of G.I.s can take that desert trek. Remember that, will you? Always fly in shoes you can walk home in if that's what you've got to do. And Phil turned out some walking sticks, hollow tubing that would also double as tent poles later on. By 2100 that night, after a couple of hours sleep, they got ready to go. Sam planned on traveling until daybreak. He wanted to make 25 miles the first two nights and average about 10 a night from then on. Yeah, they were set, even to taking along blood chits and money purses, which were to soften up any natives they might run into. They felt that if the chits wouldn't work, the money purse would. The money and plenty of tact and diplomacy, always a must with natives, desert, jungle, or anywhere else. Well, that was that. Let's try this thing on, Skipper. Swell. That's fine. You don't want That's the bucket under your arm. No, no, this a little. I see. Okay. Yeah. Hey, Bob, here's another box of dextrose tablets. Stick them in your pocket. Okay. I put some gum in your pocket, too, Bob. Thanks. Here's your pole. Well, looks like I'm all set. Hey, wait a minute. What are you going to use? Oh, I'll be okay. Yeah, how about that? <laughs> now, Gil, it's up to you to take care of things around here. Keep working at the radio, and if the batteries get weak, run up the good engines for a while. But keep them covered, a sandstorm might come up. Now, be sure and watch out for Jim and Shorty, and burn those signals. Something's bound to work, I hope. Here's your canteen. Thank you. How's it feel? That's going to be swell. Now, make sure that the boy's wounds are covered with sulfur powder and always bandaged. We don't want to take any chances on infections. And, uh, keep up the log, Gil. You make a good record. Right. Bob? How about you? You about ready? You bet, sir. Now, remember, everybody, Bob and I have charted our course directly southeast of here. Now, we'll try to leave some kind of a marker whenever we can. So, if you get picked up first, you can track us down that way. Well, I guess that's it. Yo, good luck, Sam. Thank you. Now, uh, if you don't fly over us before we get to the Oasis, we'll be back here with help in about seven days. And Phil, that doesn't mean that you're to go on a water binge on the sixth day. <laughs> Skipper, yo. I... Would you take this? Thank you, Phil. Come on, Bob. Well, come on, fellas. Let's get those fires fed and set the signals. could. Their various signal devices, the panels reading need medical attention. Now all they need is a plane to see them. Nothing more to do. Nothing, that is, but make waiting as endurable as possible. Okay, Shorty. I'll try it tonight. Take it easy. Bob and Sam weren't doing so badly. They walked 13 miles the first night, and now they were taking it easy. With no natural shade available, they used their walking sticks for uprights and set up their parachute tent. Then to prepare those beds, they dug down into the sand, down where it's several degrees cooler. Comfortable? Well, it could be a whole lot worse. The point is, you want to know the angles. In winter, for instance, when there are rains, they wouldn't have followed that dry riverbed. A flash flood could send a raging wall of water roaring down upon them in a very few seconds' time. And in the winter, too, they might have found water to drink. 
in the lowest point in a bend of that channel, a few feet beneath the bed. There are in a native water hole. But this is the bone dry part of summer when there's just not a drop anywhere. The temperature under that wing, August the 6th, was 129. 129. You perspire in that kind of weather, no matter how still you are. And you sweat the salt from your body. That's not good, because a lack of that salt can cause cramps and heat exhaustion. Salt tablets? Sure, they're just what you need, if you've got plenty of water. But these lads haven't, so they're doing the next best thing. They keep their perspiration to a minimum and conserve what salt they have in their system. This was the second day of their trek, and Sam and Bob were beginning to find out just how tough walking across the desert can be. It took plenty of willpower not to strip, but Sam knew that the Arabs wear their clothes for a reason. The evaporation of perspiration has a definite cooling effect. Stripped to the skin, their perspiration would be gone too soon. The cooling effect, over too quickly. How far we come, Skipper? About 25 miles. At least that's what I get by my count. 25 miles. Not even halfway yet. Oh, don't think about it, kid. Go on, let's try to get some more rest, huh? When you get this weak, you may be tempted to drink any liquid. The alcohol in your compass, your own urine, gasoline, or even oil. Don't. That's the quickest way to lose the fight. It takes willpower and guts to stand a gaff. Remember, a lot of good men have beaten the desert. It's tough, but it can be done. Hey, don't be a chump. A sandstorm can be murder. The only thing to do is button up your clothing, put a dust mask or a cloth over your mouth and nose, and duck into whatever shelter's available. Don't go running around looking for shelter. You're liable to get off course. And if the sand starts piling up around you, roll over. Guys, ever heard of a mirage? Take it easy.
favor. of brains and guts and luck learn to stay alive the hard way and so a little less than one month later at a desert base in north africa the crew of the pippin rejoined its group and was back in operational flight the crew of pippin the second that is also a different crew. Different because it's wiser. Never again will these men be caught without any one of those vital items of emergency equipment. They'll carry them in their plane, in their chute packs, in their pockets. Those items are weapons. Weapons with which to battle the desert and win. The easy way. Hurry up, Bill. Okay, Skipper. 